So any other document, whether it's uh, Einstein and the equations, it's authoritative because of where it's from. It's not authority by itself. It's inanimate. Right, not like it's some kind of uh, leather-bound no, god, like fourth no, person of the Trinity. Whatever. This is it. Yeah. You got that. But anyway, these developments in Western civilization, many technical things were developing, like I said, the printing press and uh, Bible translation, making the Bible available to the people, and the people then wanted to know, and they, that's why they translated it. I historically have been angry at the Catholics uh, using Latin. But see, they use Latin for all the languages, uh, the development of the church, because there's unity. But there's also a factor of disunity because people couldn't understand Latin. So the reformers understood that, but their intention was to show liturg uh, liturgical unity. We all, in all languages, every place, we all do the same thing. Yeah, whether you speak Slavic, Celtic, Germanic, it what have you. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. All, there happens to be something like 7,200 languages of dialects today, and, and if you speak in all those, and uh, you have to speak some unifying language, right. which I think is Pike and Knight is taught mimics, but anyway, uh, or Dr. Uh, He's doing linguistics, but he's doing Pike and Knight is talking meanings. But anyway, uh, the development, all these developments, there's no way to overestimate the development of the whole authority structure in the Catholic Church, whole traditional action, and this became the authority for the church, and therefore uh, the, the validly ordained priest was a disseminator of truth. Right, and, and the scientific revolution undercuts all of that. Now, and correct, but also it's beginning to undercut. With the it doesn't just happen just right. in the morning when you announce it, or I announce it. Sure. But uh, it, the printing press and uh, translating the Bible made it available, but, but most people, again, we've said this before, but most people couldn't read. Right. Not ignorant, I do not identify, no. Probably 75% of the world is non-literate today. But that doesn't mean that I think they're ignorant. Sure. They just can't read nor write. So they cannot evaluate other systems. They're locked in their cage until they get linguistic freedom. Well, anyway, these developments, the Reformation starts. Uh, everybody probably within hearing distance know that the Reformers are all Catholics. Roman Catholic priest. Uh, Luther was a Roman Catholic. Calvin was a Roman Catholic. Melanchthon was a Roman Catholic. Well, there weren't any of uh, the reformers, if we could go on and on and on, uh, uh, that weren't Roman Catholic. What they broke with was the authority structure. And in that midst, in that midst, came the development of science that seemed to be a solution to this impasse. Mm -hmm. And where did science in any defensible sense develop? In Western Christian civilization. Every great scientist, every great scientist in the history of science, every great scientist, and I don't think Babylonians were great scientists or the Egyptians, even though they had science. And they were sharp. and They were intelligent, yeah. but uh, when you start getting science a science, it has to be testable. You can't just have a systematic and consistent view because idealism, which is pantheism, is also systematically consistent. Right. This is what, when you get to him, Hegel was an idealist. He was internally, his system was internally consistent, but it didn't solve anything, it didn't create science. So it's something wrong with uh, the pantheistic system. Though, uh, anyway, from the 4th and 5th century, you, you've got the, the creeds, the authority of the church, voice of the church, reformation coming, and all the trouble, you had, everybody's heard of this nonsense, you've had the, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, the Renaissance was rebirthed. What does that have to do with this total discussion? The Renaissance was rebirthed. Well, what, what needed rebirth in Christian civilization? Well, the whole issue of truth and integrity. But notice, the Renaissance 
the rebirth came about when they start asking questions how do you renew how do you renew the culture the intellectual world in the in the renaissance and then when they start asking questions then you start getting skepticism by deep in the 16th and 17th century western is deep skepticism so it almost develops maybe a yeah, an attitude of, at least a slight attitude of suspicion oh, about traditional belief. No question, no question. So they didn't have an answer. They didn't have a solution, but they had deep suspicions. Correct, a hermeneutical suspicion. I don't know the answer, but I'm suspicious of the answers that, that you give me. Wait, that's and they had their reasons for that, right yes. or wrong. And it is not an accident that in the 17th century, in the very context of the brilliant Descartes, that's René from Cartes. It's, right. yeah, that's Descartes, not his name, but I'm sure you wanted to know that. But Descartes <laughs> was a mathematician. See you back to Plato. Mm -hmm. He said Descartes was trying to get absolute certainty in a culture that is deeply skeptical. Right. He was trying to give them a, an anchor, something they could, a mooring they could. Correct. Thank you for letting me be here. <laughs> okay. No, that's exactly right. He was, you can't just jump in and say, well, we don't pay attention to Descartes. Well, put Descartes in his world. His world was dominated by people that asked more questions than they had answers for. Well, there's nothing evil. I don't want to stop people from asking questions, but a fool can ask a question and 10 wise men can't answer. So anyway, in his world, skepticism was a deep, deep, intellectual cultural problem in the world of Descartes. It was kind of like an emerging crisis, if you will. It's just a crisis period. This yeah. is perfectly fine. That's far better than what I said. <laughs> but it, it's very important for none of us to forget the crisis of deep skepticism. They were skeptical of what? You already know. They were skeptical of the received views that they had inherited. And, and, and so the idea is that maybe the, the Reformation, which you know a lot of us would say was a healthy response to uh, some of the uh, practices that the church was uh, in, or engaging in, um, questionable things, but at the same time, while it was a healthy response, maybe, maybe then it suddenly creates some people to mind to say, well, gee, you know, I thought the church was always perfect. I thought it, it was true. It had integrity. Now that the Reformation points out that you know these people are people, and they were maybe they're wrong about selling the indulgences, what have you. What else are we wrong about? Where is where can we have confidence? All oh, this is coming to pass when they started studying the Bible. Right now, I knew Martin Luther, and I told him to stay out of the Bible. When he started studying the Bible, he got new questions. Like like Romans, you see. Romans. Yeah. He was a Roman Catholic with an earned doctorate. Roman Catholic, brilliant man. Well, he served in his class sure. of about a thousand, so that's not overly bad. Right. But you don't know about the other two that were the first and second, but you know about Martin Luther, so that's another bad. But anyway, Martin Luther was the first authorized, because he was Catholic, Catholic priest, yeah. to teach in the Catholic institution, the Roman epistle. Now, I mean, up to that point, the church didn't see any need study in the Bible. Okay. You had an earned doctorate in the what was the theology? Aristotelian metaphysics, that's what the, the theology was. It was systematic theology in Aristotelian straitjacket. Were they, were they motivated to position someone like a scholar like Martin Luther to to uh, teach something like Romans because of the Bible becoming more and more available to the masses due to the well, Gutenberg there, galaxy? There's no question in my mind about that. See, when the Catholic Church starts opening that door, now again, till the press, printing press, Bible translation, people in general did not have, who had the Bible? They didn't have access to it. Only yeah. scholars had the Bible. And it was very expensive because he couldn't reproduce it. You couldn't it buy it. You, yeah. you could buy it if you had one. Then they started making them cheap. Then people could, but then they were not prepared to read them. Right. So giving people the truth doesn't mean they're capable of reading it then or now. Right. And then a bunch of cans of worms are suddenly open. No, no. You can open up 
Pandora's box. You can't put her back, back in once you open it up. But anyway, these are all positive developments. Right. But all positive by themselves, uninterpreted, are not necessarily constructive. Right. I hesitate to say good. Any advancement is in good. some sense good. But anyway, the Reformation comes, and for the first time in, in at least, well, more than that, but 1,500 years, you recover biblical preaching in the Assembly of the Saints. Because of the Reformation. There was no public preaching like we know right. in the churches so, today. So the printing press and the Reformation. And, but the uh, public preaching, there was the liturgy. Could you imagine yeah. filling a, a, a citadel of four or five hundred thousand or three thousand people just on the liturgy today? Not See, Eastern Orthodox is highly liturgical, but how do you control, get people, first of all, together, and then how do you get them committed when it's just liturgical? Or how do you engage their mind? See, they because, it, because it's reduced maybe just religious experience. Now, that's it. all you've got, liturg nothing evil about, right. about singing, or, or, but they just chanted. They didn't yeah. have musical notation. Right. See, when they were doing the liturgy, so it's, yeah. you had the... the the, the chance mm -hmm. that they find uh, today. And, and you had the, 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 the environment of, of the, the church, the uh, architecture the of the architecture, building. Architecture, right, the beauty oh. of that. And it kind of puts you in a different state of mind. Oh, yes. Change they your didn't brain have any state. functionalism. It looked like retired Raleigh salesman. Right, right. There was an elegance and a beauty, and it was no. inspiring. No, and it was the church that paid those great artisans, like the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. See, he painted, painted that magnificent work in the Sistine Chapel, sitting on his back, laying on his back. You can't sit on your back. Laying on his back, and he printed that magnificent thing. This, to this hour, one of the most magnificent works of art in history. The church paid for that. Well, the church paid for all the music. You don't get Bach and Beethoven, and you start getting music unfolding in that literature. The church, the church was the chief patron of the arts. Of, of, and they paid for it. So the artisans, they didn't make a million dollars for this work of art, like today they bought that. They were working for the church. Right. Well, you don't get geniuses just cowing to the church unless they're convicted to that. Mm -hmm. So you can't, and I think, you cannot explain why these great artisans, literary artisans, artisans uh, are doing physical, uh, visible art without conviction? You cannot intimidate brilliant, creative minds very long. And, and, and an artist wants to, wants to have their work appreciated. And if I'm if I'm painting some kind of a fresco or painting, you know, in, in a in a in a chapel in a church, I know that. You know, Everybody several times will we, know that Michelangelo. Yeah, the, 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 they'll see my stuff and they'll say, "Wow, that is that's beautiful," and 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 it'll be rewarding because I will have moved all those people, and, and especially if it's in the name of God and it's the gospel a of Christ. See, there's nothing ugly about that. Yeah, it's just oh, that's marvelous. That's not like me throwing a bucket of paint up on the wall right. and saying, "Look at that. That's worth a million dollars." Right. You'd yeah. be arrested for messing the wall up. Right. That's Sure, you that's what happens in my show. Art. Talent, no talent, yeah, whether music, whether art, talent. Talent was God's talent, yes, which I also believe that's still biblically the case. So, how do you control? I must not use that word, it's not like uh, Christianity, the Bible, the church controlling talent, right? A talented person in a technical sense can't be controlled. But if it go either by force or conviction, that's how you control anybody in any system in the world. Conviction or control. You have to have armed forces, police, armed guards. You have to control them uh, or convict them, and then you don't have to control Conviction them. or compulsion. No, you're just correct. Thank you for the... For the it, I see no escape from that. Whatever you're doing, whether it's Hitler, whether it's the church, sure. whether it's today, uh, 